Imagine a majestic mulberry tree, its roots deep in the earth, branches reaching toward the heavens. The mulberry experiences many seasons just as we do, often finding ourselves facing the same challenges over and over again, with our flaws forming what feels like unbreakable patterns. Those mistakes can make us feel like we're circling around that mulberry tree, like the old nursery rhyme describes, round and around. But in our brokenness, could there be hope? Could the cross, that tree, really rescue us from these never-ending cycles? Could this tree offer the hope that we so desperately are seeking? What if those shortcomings are the very soil in which God can grow something beautiful? Wow, wow, wow. Can we give Jesus one big hand clap today? Aren't you thankful that you're in the house of God and not in jail? Come on. Amen, amen. Hey, I also wanna welcome all of our live streamers. We got Peru, we got Thailand, California, Michigan, Georgia, New York City, Ohio, Virginia, and Indiana. Can we give it up for them for joining us online? We got people from all over the place. Good to have you. My name is Troy Maxwell. My wife is, uh, my wife and I are the senior pastors here. And I uh, also wanna welcome you to Empty Tomb Visibility Today. Just wanna make that clear. Let me say it one more time, just in case you didn't catch it. Empty Tomb Visibility Day. That's what it is today, all right? Jesus really is alive. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I'm an only child, so I have no brothers or sisters, and uh, so I'm spoiled rotten. And uh, uh, when I was a kid, my, my mom didn't go to church that often, and uh, I don't really remember her going to church that, that much. And she would send me to my grandmother's house. I love my grandma, Mimi and Papa. They've gone, gone on to be with the Lord. But my Mimi could cook Easter Sunday. Any, any grandmas in the house? Raise your hand if you're a grandma. Just look around real quick. Look around. If you don't have anywhere to go, they'll take you. <laughs> my grandma could make, uh, she could make these rolls that were yeast rolls. And they would sit upstairs. She'd put them upstairs, and they would, like, get big. And then she'd bring them down on Easter Sunday. And I'd probably eat six of them. I don't eat that stuff now. But, but back then, I could tear it up. She would make country ham. Not none of that, you know, liberal ham, but country <laughs> ham. Salty. Salty ham. Squash casserole. Now, my wife can cook, too. Don't get me wrong. Uh, she took a lot of the recipes from my grandma, and now she makes them very, very good. And on Easter, I, I loved Easter because we would always have an Easter egg hunt. In, any Easter egg hunters out there? I mean, I, I was good. I wouldn't say that I was, like, really good at Easter, Easter egg hunting because I'd get distracted. Because I'd start getting the Easter eggs, and then I would eat what was in the Easter egg and forget that there were other eggs out there. And... We would invite all of our friends over. We did this when, when my kids were growing up. We were the house that all the kids came over, and so we would always have a big Easter egg hunt. And of course, you always hide a golden egg, which has something special in it. Matter of fact, why don't we get the juices flowing a little bit today? And uh, how, how many of y'all would like to do a little Easter egg hunt right now? Okay, well, just reach underneath your chair because under one chair somewhere in this auditorium is a golden egg with something special in it. You may have to, if you're sitting next to somebody that's not there, then you may have to look under their chair as well. When you find it, jump up. Did you, did, Easter egg, is there, there's a golden one somewhere. I know it's here. I know it's here. I'm telling you, so y'all need to get on the hunt here, because I know it's here. I think it may be somewhere uh, somewhere around the 10th row. I'm just, just, just gonna be a hint. You got it, did you get it? She's counting rows, all right, look. Well, give me a general area of where it could be over in this area right here. Sorry guys, over there. Over in this area right here, around the 10th row, there may be an empty seats beside you. You may want to look even harder. You found it. There you go. Stand up. Isn't that great? Congratulations. 
Hope you enjoy that. Spend it on yourself, not on anybody else. Be selfish today. You know, beyond the Easter Bunny, which I totally don't understand how Easter Bunny and resurrection go together, uh, Easter egg hunts are fun. And what, what is this day all about? Maybe somebody invited you today. Maybe somebody brought you to church you never been before. Maybe a mom, a grandma, a cousin, uh, a relative, a friend, a coworker. And you possibly, some of us, haven't really been looking for Jesus like we just did for that golden egg. But let me tell you something. Jesus has been looking for you. He's been searching for you. He's always searching. He's always looking for disciples. I want to look today through the eyes of my favorite disciple, Peter, at the resurrection. Um, I, I like Peter because I can connect with him. Uh, he had ups and downs. He said things that he shouldn't have said. Uh, he did things that he shouldn't have done. Peter, I think we all at some point, even if you're a, a non-Bible person, you've probably heard stories about Peter. Jesus, <clears throat> at the very beginning, meets Peter on the, the shore of Galilee. Peter is doing his thing. He's a fisherman. And fishermen were, back then, were rough. They, they cussed a lot, like Pastor Stephanie, uh, pray for. <laughs> and we see that in all four Gospels, we see kind of a different picture of Jesus meeting Peter. Andrew, his brother, had heard a sermon by Jesus and brought Peter to come and meet Jesus, saying, hey, this could be the guy. Like, this could be the Messiah. This is the person that we've been waiting for, we've heard about, our parents have talked about him, our grandparents have talked about him. Could this be the Christ? And so Peter is fishing. One, tra one of the Gospels talks about how, how he fished all night and didn't catch anything. One of the Gospels say that he's on the side cleaning his nets, and here's what happened. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, and for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me. Everybody say, follow me, follow me, follow me. Those are two simple words, but for a Jew, they were significant to a very high level because Jesus was considered a rabbi. A rabbi was more than just a teacher, he was more than just a professor of the word. He was, a rabbi was, in translation, it meant my master, a master. So when, when a rabbi would say to someone, follow me, everything about their life was about to change, everything. So for Peter to hear that, for, for Andrew to hear that, they, they were thinking, oh my gosh, my whole life is gonna change. When, when, you, when you understand the power of those two words, follow me, I mean, you can kind of put yourself in that position like they left everything to follow Jesus. What was such a big deal about it? Well, I, it took me like four applications to get in college, and I had to go to summer school too. So I didn't do very good on the SATs. I don't know if they do that anymore. I think I got the lowest score that you can get on the SATs. So I'm not very smart. So getting to college like Harvard or Yale, impossible. But imagine... Not only did you get into Harvard or Yale or one of the great schools, but you became a professor at one of those schools. Or maybe you became a, an assistant to not a Fortune 500 company or Fortune 100 company, but a Fortune 10 company. You became one of their assistants. That's what it's like for Peter, to be, be called by a rabbi, follow me. Now, what's interesting is when he made that statement, Peter said something to him that kind of lets you into the heart of what was going on in Peter's life. So when, when Jesus said, follow me, the first thing that came out of Peter's mouth was, depart from me, for my, I'm a sinful man. In other words, Peter goes, do you really know who I am? Like, do you know the mistakes that I've made, the sins I've committed? Not just the ones everybody knows about, but the ones that nobody knows about. But do, you, do you really know? I mean, like, I'm not worthy of following you. Now remember, this is a big call. So for a rabbi to call him and ask him to come was super significant and Peter's going, no, no, you don't want me. Like a lot of us. We come into a situation like this, a church like this, or we, we, we connect with God and we're like, no, 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 no. I, I, you, you, don't really, you don't really want me. You don't want me to follow, follow you. I'm unworthy. 
Or we start to try to prove ourselves like Peter did. To be enough for God. To, to do enough. I remember my mom said one time when I got saved and started inviting her to church, she would say, well, I'm not good enough to come to church. I'm like, that's, that's not how it works. You don't come, you don't get good and come to God. You come to God and he'll get you good. That's how it works. I mean, it, that, we have it flipped around. See, Peter was trying to be enough for God. And listen to me, church, you'll never be enough. That's why his name is more than enough. He's able to deal with all of our unworthiness. He's able to deal with all of our mistakes. Matter of fact, Jesus doesn't see us through the mistakes of the past. He sees us in the seat of our potential. Well, Peter, he gets picked and he joins the team, one of the 12. And we find him in a boat as Jesus has just fed 5,000 people and sends his disciples on a mission to go to the other side. And so the 12 disciples, many of which are fishermen, are in this boat, and, and a storm comes, and it's a crazy storm. Jesus had gone up on the mountain to pray, and now he's come down, and Jesus is walking on the water to get to the other side before the disciples, and the disciples and Peter see this, this, this figure on the water, and all the disciples are like, that's a ghost, and Peter, Peter, goes, I don't know, it look, kind of looks like Jesus. I wonder if it's him. Could it be him walking on the water? I mean, this is crazy. We've seen some miracles. We've seen people get healed of blindness and raised from the dead, but walking on the water? I've been fishing all my life. I've been throwing all kinds of stuff into the water, and it usually goes to the bottom. And now Jesus is walking on the water. So Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out on the water. Now, I don't know what was going on in Peter's mind at that moment. I, I don't know. Now, we can find out. One thing I love about heaven is we'll be, it's 8K in heaven. You can see they have big screens up there. You can watch all these stories anytime you want. They have a room that's just set aside for you to watch the stories of the gospel. And you could probably hear what was going on in their mind. I'm sure God will have that in there as well as like subtitles at the bottom. This is what Peter was thinking when he said this to Jesus. Well, I think he, he, he was thinking, Okay, I just told him that I could come out on the water. I hope he doesn't think I'm gonna walk on it like he is. Because, I, you know, I think he might be the Messiah. And so Jesus responds, so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, and he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, notice these words he says, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I mean, come on, Peter walked on the water. Yeah, he sank, but he walked on the water. None of the other disciples did that. You know, Jesus didn't rebuke Peter for getting out of the boat. He didn't rebuke Peter for walking wrong on the water. He didn't say, hey, Peter, if you would have walked with your toes down, you would have stayed up longer. That's not what he said. Jesus didn't rebuke Peter for sinking. No, he rebuked or questioned Peter's faith. Why do you doubt? The word doubt means to be double-minded. It means to be hesitant or uncertain or indecisive. When I was a kid, um, this was pre-cell phones, pre-beepers. If you don't know what a beeper is, just talk to your mom or dad. They probably had one at some point in their life, maybe. Maybe. Well, this was back in the day where your mom or dad kicked you out of the house every day during the summertime. <laughs> it wasn't an option to watch TV. It wasn't an option to get on your iPhone, your iPad, play video games. It was, um, as soon as the sun comes up, you're out. <laughs> I got things to do, places to go. I don't care where you go, what you eat. Come on, who knows what I'm talking about right here? You know exactly what I'm talking about. And so, and then just be back at dark or somewhere around in that time, all right? Just be back around. No way to contact you. No way. You, you only had shorts on, no money. So me and my friends, I was probably like 10, 11, 12 years old doing this. We would go about two or three miles away, yes, two or three miles away without parental 
You know, some of you are like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. My kids are not allowed to go off the porch. <laughs> well, we would go two or three miles away to this place called the uh, Staples Mill Pond. It was a huge pond, and it had a waterfall that spilled over into this big gorge at the corner of Dumbarton and Staples Mill Road. And you couldn't really see down in the bottom, and so us kids, there's about five or six of us, some older ones, some younger ones, we would go down in the bottom because it had a waterfall, and behind the waterfall was this cool tunnel, man. It was like a huge tunnel you could walk into it and get back underneath all the apartments, and it was awesome. And so this day we were there, and there was a, in order to get to that ledge where you could go through the waterfall, you had to jump this little gap that was probably, I'd say maybe 12 feet. And it was a 30-foot drop to the bottom. And I had done it a couple times, you know, like run. Yeah, and you had to get a run and start, so you had to like run, and you had to, uh, and jump, and land on the other side, uh. And then you could go, oh, yeah, I made it. Now, I watched the big kids do it over and over again. I'm like, yeah, I got this, man. So, so I get on the other side, and I start running. And I, I remember this specific time where I hesitated just a little bit. Now, I made it, because I'm here, but I made it <laughs> to the other side. I landed. I'll never forget. I landed, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then I walked off like that. I played it off because that's what you do when you're 12 years old. You're like, yeah, I got that. I was just playing around a little bit, you know. <laughs> but inside, inside, my heart was racing like I almost died. Nobody would have known. My mom wouldn't care. I mean, she, she told me all the time, you know, I'll kill you. Make another one just look, look, look just like you. She would say that all the time to me. That's what doubt is. Doubt is getting to the edge and hesitating. Do I really trust God? Do I trust him to take the leap? Do, do I trust him to, to take my life? I mean, will he follow through? I know I hear it all the time. I hear it, I read about it in the Bible, I hear it at church, but I mean, if I take that jump, if I, if I really give him everything, can I trust him? Can I fully trust him that he will carry me even when I might fall? Look, we all have doubts. Like Peter, he doubted just for a second, looked around at the winds and the waves, looked around at the circumstances, like all of us do. We all kind of look around and we go, you know, I want to trust Jesus. I, I want to give him everything, but what will I lose? What will I have to let go of? How, how will this work out? And see, that's the, that's the faith part of it. Oh, you have little faith. That's, that's the hard part. That's the part that we don't know that we have to trust God to take the leap. And sometimes it feels like we land on the other side and we feel like we're gonna fall, but Jesus is always there to catch us because it says Jesus picked him up and pulled him right back up on the top and took him right to the boat and calmed the storm like he always does. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful to know that we can really trust God? We can trust him. In 1976, one of the greatest movies of all time came out, Rocky. Dun, 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 Da -da -da. I mean, I just love that movie. I'm fired up right now. <laughs> I, was, uh, I, was, I was seven years old when it came out. Um, my mom and I, in order to get anywhere, we had to hitchhike. Now, for those of y'all that are, you know, hitchhike, you stick your thumb out, and then somebody picks you up in a car. It's, a, it's a different than Uber. <laughs> There's no app involved, okay? You don't know who's picking you up. That's the exciting part. It could be a serial killer. They could be, who knows? But hey, pick me up. Take me where I want to go. And so if they're going in your direction, just stick your thumb out. Don't, I wouldn't do it today, but I'd just say that's what we did. So we get to the movies. We go to Ridge Theater. I remember it because I came out of that movie seven years old. Come on. Man, I, I, I was ready to box everybody. I was ready to kill everybody. I mean, I was jumping all around, man. I was like, I'm going to be the best boxer ever. You know, and then we had to hitchhike. But anyway, uh, Rocky. Let me, let me tell you, Peter, I believe, is the OG Rocky. 
Let me explain it to you. Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist and some Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Look at verse 16, Peter. I love it, man, I love it. Nobody else said it. Peter answered and said, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Dun, 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 I mean, he nailed it. Jesus answered, said to, to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. You're Rocky. See, he's the OG Rocky. And on this rock, I will build my church and the, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now understand, when we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see, well, well, he was Peter way before that. No, no, no. Remember, they are writing this in retrospect. Jesus had already been raised from the dead. And so they saw Peter as Peter, but his original name was Simon, Pebble. He was just a small, little, little, little stone until Jesus told the disciples, listen, what happened just now was significant. See, what he wasn't talking about is building the church on the, the fact that he nailed that he was the Messiah. It was how he got to that revelation, that understanding. See, for Peter, up to this point, nobody had ever heard the voice of God unless you were a prophet or a rabbi. So for Peter, a disciple, to say, you're the Messiah, Jesus knew God had spoke to him. That this veil had already started to be torn away in his own heart and he heard the voice of God. Now, don't get too excited because just like Rocky, he gets knocked down again. Look, just, just a few verses later, probably less than 30 minutes goes by from that time. Because he's, Jesus is excited, man. I can't believe he got it. I'm glad Peter got it. I'm so excited. He's doing so good. I think he's going to be the one. I think he's going to make it. But from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Jesus is talking about his purpose from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day, then Rocky. Pull Jesus aside. Come here, Jesus. We got to talk for a second. This shall not happen to you, Lord. In other words, he rebuked God. Now, I've said some things to God that I don't, didn't wanna say, but I'll be honest with you, I've never said, I rebuke you, God. Never in my life have I ever done that. He rebuked God, but he turned, Jesus turned and said to him, get behind me, Satan. Okay, time out. If you're a Christian, and the pastor called you Satan, you'd never go to that church again, <laughs> would you? Don't look at me like, oh, I'd probably stick around. No, you wouldn't. You'd be like, that Pastor Troy, he called me Satan. He said, get behind me too. He didn't just say, call me Satan. He said, get behind me, Satan. I was just you know, making a comment about something, about what they were trying to accomplish. No, see, 30 minutes prior to this, Peter had heard the voice of God, and now he heard the voice of the devil and responded to try to change the purpose of God in Jesus. And so, so just as quick as Peter jumped up and was ready to fight, he gets knocked down again. He listens to the wrong voice, and Jesus rebukes him. But Rocky gets back up again. And just one chapter later, Jesus takes another shot. And he says, hey, Peter, James, and John, I want you to go up on this mountain with me. I wanna show you something. And so the disciples are asleep and, and all of a sudden they wake up to this picture of Jesus, a transfigured Jesus. I think what Jesus was doing in this moment was showing Peter, James, and John his true identity. They had seen him so much in his human form that Jesus revealed himself in his divine, godly form. And the Bible says Elijah and Moses showed up, and of course, Peter gets a glimpse of this, and he goes, let's just stay here forever. We don't need to go down ever again, Jesus. 
we'll build a tent for you. Obviously, it'll be bigger. And then we'll do one for Moses and we'll do one for Elijah and we'll just stay here forever. And Jesus is like, oh my gosh, Peter, you're just not getting it. And then we get to the crescendo. I could spend probably three hours going through all the ups and downs that Peter goes through in his wrestling match of feeling unworthy and trying to prove himself and saying the right thing and then saying the wrong thing and doing the right thing and then doing the wrong thing and up and down. And, and it's, it's, so, it's so amazing to think about because, because we can see ourselves in this, in and out and up and down and saying the right thing and not saying and doing the right thing and not doing the right thing. And then we get to the end. And Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. He has, he's had the last supper with them. And then he turns to his disciples and he says to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Verse 33, Rocky. Rocky. Here he is again, answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Think about it, he's going, look, all these knuckleheads over here, these 11 guys, actually 10 now, because Judas is gone. And so these 10 guys over here, Matthew, ugh, he's, gonna, he's gonna, definitely gonna stumble. John, he's crying right now, he's gonna stumble. <laughs> Thomas. I mean, we don't even know if he believes. I mean, he's over here doubting all the time. So, I mean, you know he's good. But me, Jesus, <laughs> me, I will never stumble. Even if all are made, Jesus said to him, <laughs> okay, okay, Rocky, settle down a little minute. Settle down. Surely I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, no, no. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. They, they, they get in there on it after he says it. Look, less than 24 hours later. Less than 24 hours later. Having arrested him, Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. Verse 57, but he denied him. What? Okay, Peter, just, just less than 24 hours ago, you said you'd die with him, but now you're saying you don't even know the guy. Saying, woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another say, saw him and said, you also are of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow also was with him, for he's a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Can you imagine can you imagine what it felt like in his heart? He had just denied his best friend. Not just once, not just twice, but three times. And not only did he deny him three times, Jesus told him he was gonna do it and he said he denied that. Like, I'm not gonna do it, Jesus. Like, I'm, I would never deny you. I'll die with you. The next verse shakes me every time I read it. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I remember the first couple times I read that verse, I used to think, was he mad at him? Like, what, do you think he was angry at Peter? I don't think so. Because remember, he knew it all the time. You know, he knows us better than we know ourselves, doesn't he? He really does. He knows our thoughts. He knows our deepest desires. He, he knows what we're going to do. He knows how we're going to do it. He knows what we're going to say, how we're going to say it. He, know, he knows it all. And he looked at Peter. I think 
It wasn't an angry look. It wasn't, uh, I'm hurt, you did this to me. I think it was a, I knew you were going to do it, and I still love you. Matter of fact, I was there the whole time watching you do it. I know you messed up, but I still care for you. I know it hurts, man, but I'm right there with you. I think this look is what solidified this relationship that Peter thought that he had lost, but Jesus would re rekindle. You know, I'm almost done. We can look at the resurrection theologically. When we, when, we, when we do, the resurrection is beautiful. I mean, think about this. From the beginning of time, from, from the moment that God said, let there be light, there was a plan in place for humanity to deny him, to walk away from him, to disobey him, that from the beginning, all through the scriptures, from Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Psalms and Proverbs and Jeremiah and, and Isaiah and Malachi, all the way up to the point where Jesus was born as from, from in, in a virgin birth, God had orchestrated this whole plan to, to restore you and me to a relationship that we lost in the garden because of one mistake. And he, he, this is what's so beautiful about the resurrection that not only did Jesus die for us, but he was raised from the dead. See, this is what separates us from any other religion, from Buddhism and Islam and, and Confucianism and every other religion is those religions are based on us searching for God, but Christianity is about God searching for us. That's what it's all about. It's about a God who loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son, not just to die for you. Listen, Muhammad is still dead. Buddha is still dead, but Jesus is alive. He is sitting at the right hand of God, ever living to make intercession for you and me. You, you can look at the resurrection theologically. You can look at the resurrection historically, and it is proven that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's the most consequential, but also the most, most controversial thing that ever happened. Scriptures tell us that 500 people saw Jesus raised from the dead. Why in the world would people be crucified upside down, burned at the stake, eaten by lions for a lie? Why in the world? That would be a really good lie. No, no, no. Jesus really did get raised from the dead. It is a proven historical fact. So you can look at it theologically, you can look at it historically, but the most important way to view the resurrection is personally. Because the resurrection offers us all a chance to be forgiven, to start over. Not just once, <laughs> not just once, but every time, every time you see the glorious power of God ripping Jesus from that grave, a new part of your life is opened up and God is able to heal us and free us and deliver us and show us the purpose that he has for our lives. Everlasting life is what Jesus called it. See, it's more than just a get out of jail free card. I can do whatever I want, you know, and Jesus was raised from the dead, and, you know, I don't have to do anything. I can sin, and that's what God's grace is for. No, no, no. No, when you really, when you, when you, truly, when you truly see the resurrection, everything changes about your life. Everything, everything becomes different. It goes into color. It, it goes from black and white to color. It, it, everything about your life shifts in a way that you see him and, and, you, and you, wanna, you wanna love him more every day of your life. You, you see your, your sins dropping off. Look, you're not perfect. You're, you're doing your best. You're giving it your best shot like Peter. You, you, you feel so unworthy, but then you bump into God one day. And he goes, you don't have to be worthy because I was already for you. You bump into God and go, I don't know if I can trust you. And he goes, that's okay because everybody feels that way. But if 
you'll just have faith. This too shall pass. There's something better on the other side. You, you really can make it. Things will change if you'll just take, take the leap. Take the leap. We all listen to the wrong voices, don't we? But Jesus is always there to correct us and nurture us and guide us. And let's be honest. Look at me, look at me, look at me. We, let's be honest. We've all denied him in some way. But the rooster has already crowed. And Jesus is looking at you. He's peering. Not with a not with a look of anger, not with a look of hurt, but with a look of love. See, restoration is not just an event, it's a journey we are invited on with Jesus. Now follow me here. I'm almost done. I, I promise. This is my second close, my final one. Peter's full of guilt. He's full of shame. He's full of regret. He's full of grief. He's full of heartache. Jesus has died. He's raised from the dead. And he shows up at the same beach that he met Peter on. Because Peter, because he denied him, because of the hurt, because of the shame, because of the guilt, he just says, I'm just going to go fishing again. I'm going to go back to my old life and just try to do it my way again. I know it didn't work, but hey, I don't know anything else to do. I don't know what else to do. I'm just going to go back. I'm just going to start drinking again, or I'll, I'll just start dating again, or I'll just move in with so-and-so. Or I'll just do it again, whatever I did before, because it just didn't work, because I feel so hurt. And there's Jesus on the beach. I can just imagine the picture. And Peter's fishing just like he was before. And Jesus, Peter, hey, yo, Peter, over here. Peter sees him. Could it be? Could, could it? Is that, is that? And he dives in the water, swims to the shore. Jesus says, hey, come here for a second, Peter. Let's go for a walk. And imagine he's walking down the beach and looks at him. He says, hey, Peter, do you love me? Peter, a little confused. Of, of course I love you. Like, why, why would you even doubt that? I, what, what, what's, what's going on? Peter looks at him and feed my sheep. I imagine, this is just the way I see it. Jesus probably puts his arm around him like a father to a son. Says, hey, hey. Maybe stops, looks at him, says, do you love me? Peter, confused again, but I just told you that I loved you. Don't, this is all that's going on. I, you know, I, I know, man, I'm hurting. He, he probably is a little shocked that Peter, that Jesus is even there, and he's asking the question, do you really love me? And, 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 and Peter's response again is, but Jesus, you know, you know that I love you. I take care of my sheep. And I, I, I can just see where Jesus stops, has Peter standing in front of him, looks at him one more time and says, hey, hey, do you love me? Tears start streaming down Peter's face. Because church, I think we've all been in that place where we've questioned, does God still love me? And his answer to you today is absolutely. He loves you. And this is what I love about the whole story. This is what's so great about the Bible, man. This is what's so amazing. You know what he says to Peter after this? That's how it all started. Peter on the shore fishing, follow me. And right at the end, after all of the stuff that Peter went through, Jesus says to him, follow me. Follow me. I want you to stand with me today. And if you could, if you don't mind, just grab the person's hand beside you. See, it was... The restoration Jesus provided that gave Peter the relationship he really needed. Maybe you don't feel worthy today, accepted. Maybe you don't feel like you're enough. 
Jesus says, follow me. Maybe you got some doubts. Maybe you haven't been to church in a long time. You, you, you tried it once before and got your heart beat up and kicked around and broken, betrayed. Jesus is saying, follow me. Maybe you're like Rocky and you just got knocked down again. And you don't know if you can get up this time. You really don't know. You don't know if, if this is the time I just need to stay down because I, I just, I don't have the energy to get up one more time. Jesus says, follow me. Or maybe, maybe you denied him with your life, with your actions, with what you said. But Jesus says, follow me, follow me, follow me. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes right where you are. If you're here today and you want to accept that call, follow Jesus. I really do. I love him. I don't know. I don't even know what that all means, but I want to, I want to follow him maybe for the first time. Maybe you've never made that decision before. You've never decided to follow Jesus. You've never thought about the idea of giving everything away and just completely taking that leap. And you don't even know what it means, but Something on the inside of you. Let me tell you what that is. That's the Holy Spirit moving on your heart, saying you can do it. You have a God who loves you, who sent his son to die for you. Or maybe, maybe you're here today and you followed him at one time, but you walked away and went your own direction. Guess what? The invitation still stands to follow Jesus. And you can make that decision right now to give your life to Jesus. Absolutely, it means you'll spend eternity with him in heaven. Absolutely, it means that all your sins will be forgiven. Absolutely, one day you'll be with God in paradise. Absolutely. But he'll also give you purpose, a mission, a plan. He'll give you hope and a future. If you say, that's me, I wanna follow Jesus. I want to accept the call. I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, here's what, I just want you to simply squeeze the person's hand beside you. Just squeeze their hand. Say, that's me. Maybe for the first time. I want to go after this. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want all that stuff, but I'm lacking purpose and I'm lacking mission. And I feel scattered. I feel unworthy. I, I have so many doubts. Just, just follow him. Watch him work it all out. When I get to three, just squeeze that person's hand beside you. Or maybe you, you want to recommit, rededicate your life to Jesus Christ. Just squeeze that person's hand. You ready? One, two, three. Squeeze their hand right now. Squeeze it right now. Squeeze it right now. If somebody squeezed your hand, I want you to do me a favor. All across this room, I want you to lift that hand up. If somebody squeezed that hand, I want you to lift it up high. Lift it up high. Lift it up high. Lift it up high. Now, keep it up for a second. I want you to do something for me. Those that received the squeeze, somebody squeezed your hand, I want you to, they may kick a little bit, they may scream a little bit, they may not want to. I want you to bring them up to this altar right now. Just say, hey, come on, I want you, I want to take you up here. Just bring them up right now. And church, can you give them a hand as they make this? Just come right on up here to the front. Just come on right up here to the front. Right up to the front. Come on, come on, come on, right up here to the front. So excited. So proud of you. Come on, bring them all up here. Bring them all up here. Come on, keep clapping. Bring them up here. Bring them up here. Bring them up here. Push your way all the way to the front if you could. Bring them up here. Bring them up here. Come on, keep coming. Keep clapping. Keep clapping. Encourage them. They need some encouragement right now. Just keep coming. Keep coming. Maybe you wanted to squeeze somebody's hand, but you didn't. Get out of your seat right now and come. You don't want to miss this prayer. You don't want to miss this moment. This is your moment. Just keep coming. 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 Keep clapping. Come on, church. Keep clapping. Keep clapping. Keep clapping. Keep clapping. Keep clapping. Look at all of them. Isn't it awesome? I'm so proud of every one of you. So proud of every one of you. It's not easy. It's not easy to do that. It's not easy. All right, everybody look at me that came up here. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And then we're going to sing a song. And I don't want you to leave because I want you to worship God in this new state, this restored state that you have. 
What's happening right now in your heart is God is, is working some things. And I believe that moving forward, God's going to continue to speak to you. He's going to continue to work things in your life. Open your eyes and you'll see things like you've never seen before. It's pretty amazing. It happened to me 30 years ago. And every, every single time I see a new part of who God is, it's like, it's like I just see even, even clearer. And I've been doing this for a long time. It's like crazy how incredible God is. And so I'm going to lead you in a prayer, a prayer of de declaration over your life. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and was raised from the dead, you will be saved. The word saved means to be whole in every way. So some of you, God's going to heal you physically. Some of you, God's going to heal you emotionally. Some of you, God's going to just completely rip away that old past life that you've been wrestling with for so long. For some of you, it's just going to be a complete mind wipe and God's going to let you see things from a whole new perspective. But most of all, you'll come into relationship with a heavenly father who loves you and has been searching for you for so long. So if you could just lift both hands to heaven just as a form of surrender. Church, would you stretch your hands out to each one of these people that are here today as an extension of your faith? Say this loud, say it strong so you can hear it with your own ears. Church, join with them as they make this declaration. Everybody here say this with me. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that his blood washes me of all my sins and all my mistakes and all my past. I'm a new person. I'm a new creation. Heavenly Father, thank you for raising Jesus from the dead. Holy Spirit, come and change me. Come and fill me. Come and rearrange my life. I will follow you for the rest of my life. I will worship you. I will serve you with everything in Jesus name I just keep those hands lifted Father I thank you for purpose being deposited Father I thank you for your love like never before God let your love just like on that beach that day with Peter let your love be deposited in every heart and let today be a reminder that we're never going to be the same again in Jesus name Everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, let's give God a big hand clap. Come on, worship team. They're gonna leave, stay right here. Don't leave. Nobody's gonna steal your stuff. It's church, all right? And so they're gonna lead you in a song of worship. Just close your eyes, worship him, and watch, watch God speak to you. Listen to his voice. He's gonna talk to you in some powerful ways. God bless you guys.
It's right.